Awesome. So you guys can get started whenever. Okay. Hi, I'm Anmal. I'm an MS4 at the University of Miami, and Chloe is an MS3 also at the University of Miami. And we'll be talking about the LIFE BTA randomized control trial. Um, it's a trial on drug eluding resorbable scaffold versus angioplasty for infrapopliteal artery disease. And Dr. Vatican Cherry is our faculty advisor. And so first we'll go into a little bit of background on PAD and the epidemiology, who's affected, um, how they're effective and what we do, and then go into the journal article review. All right, so um, I first have a question. Um, I was not able to um, get my poll everywhere to work. So if everyone wouldn't mind to just answer in the chat, um, how many people do you think worldwide are affected by PAD? Okay, um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so PED is a significant global health issue affecting over 230 million people worldwide, including seven to 12 million people in the US alone. Um, it equally affects men and women and its prevalence increases with age, peaking among individuals aged 60 to 80 years old. So first, I'm going to touch on um, understanding the normal physiology of the peripheral arteries. So oxygen-saturated blood starts its journey from the left heart, courses through the aorta and into the arterial system. And as the arteries branch into smaller arterioles and then into the microscopic capillaries, they facilitate crucial processes, including delivering nutrients to vital organs, enabling gas exchange, and maintaining fluid balance to support homeostasis. Now in PAD, um, there's narrowing of the arteries due to atherosclerotic processes, um, and it often coexists with other cardiovascular issues such as coronary artery disease, stroke, atrial fibrillation, and renal disease. So the narrowing primarily is caused by accumulation of plaque, which ends up restricting blood flow through the arteries, um, and this particularly happens in the extremities. Um, commonly, PAD manifests in reduced blood flow to the legs, resulting in symptoms like claudication, um, which is experienced as leg pain during walking due to inadequate blood supply. Um, and additionally, acute ischemia can occur when the blood clots form over the plaque, which can further obstruct blood flow and lead to severe complications. All right, another question, so up to what percentage um, of patients with PAD may be asymptomatic. Yes, I see a lot of people answering C. Um, so up to 20 to 50% of patients with PAD are actually asymptomatic. Um, and 10 to 35% of patients present with intermittent claudication with manifest as pain, cramps, or paresthesia distal to the arterial occlusion. And there's different subtypes. So femoral popliteal disease is the most common. And this usually manifests as calf claudication. And then you have aorta iliac disease, which is um, presents with the triad of the bilateral buttock, hip, or thigh claudication, erectile dysfunction, and absent or diminished femoral pulses. And tibiofibular disease, which typically causes foot claudication. Um, so with patients with intermittent claudication, 
They'll usually complain of pain that worsens upon exertion um, that's relieved by rest or lowering the effective limbs. And then you can reproduce um, this pain by asking the patient to walk the same distance at which the symptoms usually occur. Um, other patients can present with rest pain, um, which occurs as the disease progressive, progresses and indicates severe ischemia. It typically occurs in the toes and forefoot and it worsens with reclining, but improves with hanging the feet off the bed or standing. Okay, next question. So what is the most severe manifestation of PAD? Okay, I see some acute limb ischemia, critical limb. So chronic limb threatening ischemia is the most severe um, presentation and manifestation of PAD. It indicates limb threatening arterial occlusion and it is associated with a high risk of amputation. It's characterized by the presence of either resting pain lasting greater than or equal to two weeks, non-healing ulcers or tissue loss. And these adverse limb outcomes um, affect the quality of life and expectancy of the patients. Um, and it actually um, has a worse prognosis than most cancers. Okay, next question. What are some exam findings in patients with PAD? Okay, yes, so six Ps for acute limb. Um, I see some loss of sensation. So um, as far as the trophic changes, you can see a decreased skin temperature and perspiration, diminished hair growth on the legs, um, slowed nail growth, um, brittle nails, atrophied muscles. Um, you can see the shiny uh, skin or bluish skin discoloration, levito reticularis, which is usually um, an advanced disease. And end-stage disease can present with gangrene, ulcers, and tissue necrosis. Um, patients can also have absent or diminished pulses due to the arterial occlusion, indicating compromised blood flow to the affected area. Um, Berger sign, which is characterized by pain in the calf upon dorsiflexion of the foot. And a brewery over the affected artery may be heard in more than 60 to 70% of uh, PAD cases as well. So for diagnosis of PAD, um, it can usually be diagnosed through a thorough assessment of risk factors and with the measurement of the ankle brachial, brachial index. Um, an ABI of 0 0.9 or less is diagnostic of PAD. Um, but imaging can also play a role to guide diagnosis and patients um, plan for a revascularization procedure or those in which a diagnosis of PAD is uncertain and the patient is symptomatic. Um, so there's different imaging modalities. Um, angiography is usually the preferred modality, um, particularly digital subtraction angiography, which is considered the gold standard. Um, and it's preferred for assessing arterial occlusion um, and collateral blood flow in patients plan for revascularization procedures. Um, the first line modality, um, includes MRA with or without IV contrast and CTA can also be used as an alternative for patients with contraindications to MRI. Um, duplex ultrasound can also be used, um, especially for patients with contraindications to angiography or for post-operative surveillance of bypass graft patency, but the limitations include lower sensitivity for multi-level stenosis and aortoiliac disease.
So now these are just some examples of um, imaging. Um, so this image is a MRA of the abdominal aorta of a patient presenting with low dependent right leg pain when walking. So if you look over um, at the overlay on the next slide, so um, highlighted in red, you could see the stenosis of the right superficial femoral artery. And as a consequence, the deep femoral artery and its branches, which is part of the green overlay, um, shows increased blood flow and tortuosity. And then the arrows represent the collateral filling of the superficial femoral artery distal to the stenosis. This next slide is another M uh, MRA of the lower limbs. And if you see from the arrows, you can see numerous stenoses um, all along the lower limbs. And then as a result, certain portions of this of several bilateral pelvic, femoral, and lower limb arteries are not visible. This next image is angiography. The upper image is the abdomen and the lower image is the pelvis. Um, so you can see in the yellow overlay um, that the abdominal aorta is occluded below the level of the renal arteries and collateral circulation, um, which is in the blue overlay, allows for um, the reconstitution of the femoral arteries, which are shown in the red overlay. Um, this dashed outline is the SMA, and then the green overlay shows the occluded aorta. And lastly, um, this is a digital subtraction angiography, which like I mentioned before, is considered gold standard. Um, so in this one, you can see occlusion of the left internal and external iliac arteries, and the locations are indicated by the green overlay um, with collateral blood flow. All right, so now we'll talk about some of the treatment options. So there's medical, surgical, and interventional management. Um, so medical management mainly focuses on um, lifestyle modification and treating the comorbidities. Um, so indications include patients with intermittent claudication, prevention and prognosis of complication and management of their comorbidities. Um, so some of the treatment options include lifestyle modification, so adopting healthy habits such as smoking cessation, a balanced diet, weight management an exercise program to improve the circulation, endurance, and overall cardiovascular health, um, lipid lowering therapy, such as statins, um, antiplatelet therapy to prevent blood clot formation and reduce the risk of thrombotic events. Vasodilators can be used um, to improve blood flow and alleviate symptoms. And then antihypertensive and hypoglycemic agents um, to manage blood pressure and glucose levels. As far as surgical management, um, surgical management is considered in low and average risk patients with specific characteristics such as extensive and complex disease, lesions of the common femoral artery, purely infrapropyl disease, chronic total occlusion or unsuccessful endovascular revascularization. And so um, one of the procedures that can be done is peripheral artery bypass surgery, um, and this is an open surgical bypass of the vascular stenosis using an autologous atal vein or prosthetic material. Um, you can also do endarectomy, um, which can be combined with endovascular treatment. Um, so this is a surgical procedure in which the inner lining of the artery is removed and along with any other associated deposits. And it's typically used to remove atherosclerotic deposits in the carotid artery or peripheral arteries of the legs. And then in severe cases, um, amputation may be warranted. As far as interventional management, um, it's considered in certain situations, including short segment disease, aortoiliac disease, or in high-risk patients. Um, a percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, often combined with stent placement and or atherectomy, 
um, can be performed. So the percutaneous transluminal angioplasty um, is a procedure in which a catheter uh, with a balloon at its tip, it's passed along a guide wire to the site of arterial stenosis, and the balloon is then inflated to relieve the obstruction. Um, and then atherectomy um, is another revascularization procedure, but it excises the athero atherosclerotic plaque from the arterial wall to improve blood flow. So unlike the balloon angioplasty, it removes the arterial plaque rather than compressing it into the arterial wall. And this is just a depiction of the um, different anatomical and extra anatomical bypass that can be done. All right, so lastly, um, for post-procedure management, um, effective post-procedure management of PAD um, involves monitoring for complications and also optimizing lifestyle modifications to support long-term vascular health. So this includes monitoring the patient's um, supportive care through pain management, wound management, and foot care, activity and mobility, um, through early mobilization and adhering to that exercise program, medication management, making sure that patients um, are adhering to their prescribed medications um, to improve those comorbidities, um, close follow-up care, and as well as lifestyle modification and risk factor management, including, like I had mentioned before, smoking cessation, healthy diet, weight management, and exercise. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. One second. Oops, not that one. Okay, so now I will go into the article review. Um, so again, we picked this article just because of how prevalent PAD is and the impact that we can have in our procedures. Um, and also, there's not too many randomized controlled trials in VIR, so it's very important that we talk about it and um, use it as inspiration. Um, so the reason that this study was done, the clinical problem is that there is increased mortality and morbidity with patients with uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia and PAD in general, and it's very prevalent in our society with the comorbidities that we have. Um, and there's limited treatment options, especially below the knee, um, with angioplasty often leading to restenosis, dissection, or with stents, there is elastic recoil. Um, there's been some treatment options, like with coronary stents, but then these are permanent stents that limit further um, procedures. Um, and surgical management has actually been shown to be inferior to interventional management. So in this study population, um, the patient um, population was um, Rutherford 4 and 5 with ischemic rest pain. Um, but not severe major tissue loss. Um, and then again, the current treatments for below the knee stenosis are angioplasty with balloon only, um, and again, uh, superior to invasive surgery. And so in this particular study, it was an industry-sponsored study um, using Abbott Vascular. It's part of the LIFE BTK trials with the Esprit scaffold device. It's a device that's placed immediately after angioplasty. It's coated with Everolimus, which is a M uh, mTOR inhibitor, and it's completely resorbed after three years, so it allows for repeat intervention if needed. So the methods for the study, this protocol was developed by Abbott um, with input from the PIs. Patients were recruited from 50 sites in six countries, so it was a multi-center, um, multi-country study. And the data was managed by the sponsor, and but it was analyzed by PIs and the sponsor with an independent data and safety monitoring and the team. So the study design, it was a randomized controlled trial with 260 patients with Rutherford 4 or 5 classification. They were randomly assigned in a two to one ratio um, with treatment to Everolimus eluding resorbable scaffold or with angioplasty alone. Um, the inclusion criteria consisted of uh, patients 18 years old or older, and they had infrapopliteal infra stenosis or in occlusion, um, and as many as two lesions could be treated, and it could be de novo or previously treated. 
Um, they didn't mention that they selected patients with shorter lesions, but they didn't say what if there was a size cutoff or how they selected that. Um, and then patients received dual antiplatelet therapy for at least one year in the scaffold group and in one month in the angioplasty alone group with a single anti um, with a single agent after this period. And then the two main endpoints looked at were the efficacy endpoint at one year, which is freedom from amputation above the ankle, freedom from occlusion of target vessel, freedom from that uh, need for revascularization of the target lesion, and freedom from binary resinosis. And then the safety endpoint was freedom from major adverse limb events at six months and perioperative death within three, uh, 30 days of the procedure. So here are the results. I highlighted some of the background demographics and characteristics. So the median age was um, about 31 years old, or sorry, 73 years old to 71 years old. Um, there was 30% females. A lot of the patients had risk factors such as tobacco use, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Um, there was about an equal distribution of class four and class five in both of the groups. Um, there was very limited patients with severe stenosis. Most of them had moderate stenosis. Um, and then it kind of gives a breakdown of the location where there was uh, most lesions were in the anterior subleural artery and kind of less for the others. And then so the results for the endpoints. Um, so in the primary efficacy group, um, there was, so 135 of the 173 patients in the scaffold group were free from the major adverse events. That was the need for revascularization, um, freedom from uh, above the knee amputation, and then 48 of the 88% in the angioplasty group alone were free from these events. So that means um, above 50% did have major adverse events or um, major events. So the this was uh, statistically significant, so scaffold was superior to angioplasty alone. And in the primary safety endpoint group, 165 of the 170 patients were free from any of the major effects um, in the scaffold group and 100% in the angioplasty alone group. And this was not, not statistically significant, so this did show that scaffold was non-inferior to angioplasty. Um, and then 2% of the scaffold group and 3% of angioplasty had serious adverse effects. And this kind of gives a breakdown. So um, for the primary efficacy endpoint, it seemed that um, there was actually similar rates of um, freedom from amputation between the two groups with two patients in the scalp, or sorry, four patients in the scaffold group um, that did need an amputation above the ankle and um, no patients in the angioplasty alone group required amputation above the ankle. Um, but there was a big difference in the uh, binary restenosis I think that that's where a lot of the significance in this result comes from. And then for the primary safety endpoint, um, there was about two to five patients in the scaffold group that qualified for any of these events, but none in the angioplasty alone group. And this is just um, a figure summarizing this data. And then again, the same data shown in a kaplan meier curve. So some limitations to the study. Um, so binary restenosis of the target lesion was added to the endpoint after the pre preliminary analysis. Um, there was an interim analysis during the enrollment period. So this was added. They also increased the um, uh, sample size of the study desired. So kind of these changes um, can lead to bias. Again, we talked about the shorter lesions um, were selected. So there's bias in that way. And so it went generalized to our patient population, we should have the data on what the size of, the, of these lesions were. And then the scaffolds were only used in the proximal two thirds of the infrapopliteal arteries. So again, can't be generalized to the entire infrapopliteal, in, oh, I can't say that word, infrapopliteal region, um, but it would be for the proximal two thirds. And then again, the study mentioned that because of the close monitoring of patients, it's more than a typical practice. So things might have been identified earlier and therefore less need for um, like amputation or further management. So discussion. There is a large benefit in regard to freedom from binary restenosis in the scaffold group in short lesions in the proximal two-third of the infrapropliteal artery. 
this study is meant to be continued. Um, the patients in the study were studied up to a year. That's what this data is from. And there will be annual follow-ups for five years. Um, and then again, non-inferiority in terms of primary safety endpoints. And this kind of gives insight into the devices that are successful in smaller caliber vessels with having the structure of a stent, but a non-proliferative coating. Um, and this also shows the need for um, randomized control trials in VIR. We have a very limited number of randomized controls and with increasing procedures and new, new procedures, new techniques, new devices, um, we need more data in this population, um, especially with having diverse populations. And then there was a study done looking at some of the RCTs in the field of VIR right now, and there was a low reproducibility index. So it suggests that there are issues kind of in the data that we do have. So a little bit of inspiration for you guys all to do some more research in randomized control trials. Um, and so that's all we had for our um, presentation. I know Dr. B wanted to talk a little bit more about the need for VR and PAD, and then we can open up the floor for questions. No, great, uh, great discussion. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff in the chat, but yeah, PAD is a very common disease, 8 to 12 million people in the U.S. I think I mentioned quarter billion in worldwide growing pandemic of diabetes, right? So I think this is a very prevalent disease. And if you look at the history of VIR initiated with Charles' daughter fixing Laura Shaw's leg in 1964, January 16th, and she had critical ischemia weather for five disease with third, fourth, and fifth digit gangrene. And he did a daughter angioplasty um, or daughtering of the SFA and uh, revascularized her successfully. So now we've obviously gone to, you know, there's four segments really when you think about PAD, area iliac, femoral, popliteal, tibial, and then pedal, or i.e. below the ankle. So there's not only are we doing kind of <clears throat> from the uh, aorta down to the femoral head, but we're now doing um, the thigh below the knee and then below the ankle. So below the ankle. And then, so I think this is kind of an important component of what we're doing. Now, when it comes to below the knee, none of our interventions have worked really well. Okay. So, so that's important, right? Now, you know, the tibial vessels are very challenging because they're very calcified. They're very long segment occlusions. And so, and they're usually seen in diabetics. When I think of a smoker, it could be aerodialic and fem pop disease. When I look at a diabetic, it's almost always in papopoteal disease. So I think that's an important thing to be kind of aware of, okay? Um, so in the infrapopoteal disease, there hasn't been a lot of things that we could do. We've tried, we cross it, blockages from the foot or from above, we open it up. And then we have um, we vessel prep, meaning we do something to debride the, the artery. So we'll use different things like lasers, these little rotor rooters that kind of burn the plaque out. Um, and then we'll try to kind of open up the vessel and get what's called luminal gain. So we'll get a luminal diameter. We check that before and after with an ultrasound inside the vessel, okay? So then finally, what we then do is when you balloon a vessel, you're cracking the intima, you're carrying it. Two things can happen. One, it can dissect, which is a, Flap of that intimo occlude the vessel. And if it's a flow limiting dissection, then you have no choice but to put a stent in to keep it open. All right. And sometimes it'll just recoil. It'll just, as soon as you balloon it, it it's like an elastic band, it'll, like a rubber band, it'll close back up. And you could try different things to reduce the recoil, but that's something that sometimes only thing is a scaffold will keep it open. When you put metal in the human body, the body doesn't like it. And the vessel, especially, you put a bare stent the body's going to aggregate platelets on it and it's going to clot off. So I think that's the key thing that you have to be cognizant of. Okay, so platelets will develop. That's why we put these patients on antiplatelets, Plavix, and aspirin. But when you have a drug on there, the drug is basically an antimitotic or something that works against kind of uh, proliferation of that. Uh, and what it does is it, uh, with antiplatelets, it prevents the scar tissue from forming. Because over time, when that stent will form scar tissue, just like if you make a cut on your body, the body will scar. Same with that metal implant. Eventually, the body has a hyperplastic 
response and it forms scar tissue and it occludes the vessel. With the drug evolution, it prevents that scar tissue from forming. But the, the, the that fiber or that 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 scar is less likely to cause a platelet aggregate. But when you have bare metal, it's more likely to have a platelet aggregate. So when we put a drug eluting stent, like a coronary stent with drug elution, like paxitaxel or everolimus, you have to keep them on blood an antiplatelets for longer. So that's something that any patient with a coronary drug elution stent, you're going to see there at least six months, if not a year, of dual antiplatelet therapy, and then maybe a baby aspirin after. So just something you have to think about when you're going through this process, okay? So now, what data do we have? So we don't have, we did all these drug-coated balloons, and below the knee, they didn't work. Randomized controlled trials didn't show a benefit. In fact, arguably higher amputation rate based on the impact deep and then the other one was a Boston Scientific. They were all negative trials. There was some coronary drug eluting stent data, Achilles, Yukon, and uh, Destiny, um, but they're short. They're like three, four centimeters long max, um, and they're very proximal. They did show a benefit compared to kind of angioplasty alone. So there was some benefit in that, those three trials. This is the first trial where you have a blow knee intervention with a drug elution specifically for PAD that showed an improvement in those outcomes that you had talked about as far as primary endpoint, which is efficacy, right? When you're coming to a clinical trial, there's three things you have to look at. Any trial compared to gold standard, you look at how safe is it, right? Because you want a pre-monocery. How effective is it compared to the gold standard? And is it durable, right? What's the durability compared to the gold standard? So if it's, if it's as effective, and as safe as the gold standard, or even safer maybe, but the durability is less, then you have to think about that for anything we do in interventional, right? So safety, efficacy, and durability are three things of clinical trials. So I think that's the kind of the key things that I've kind of gathered from this this trial. Um, Austin or Deep or anyone, Jonas, anyone want to you know, add any commentary? John, Gosson, or anybody? Hello? Yeah, um, this is Austin. I th yeah, I think it's really great that we now have uh, an RCT for um, an intervention below the knee. Um, hopefully, it can help guide our management even further because a lot of the um, options that we have so far, it's kind of a data-free zone. Um, and I, you know, seeing a lot of these patients bounce back in um, in clinic with uh, new wounds or non-healing wounds, and their tibials go down. Um, it's it's pretty discouraging. So seeing that we uh, you know have an option that could potentially be more durable for these patients, um, it's really exciting. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's the key. So we're primarily dealing with critical limb ischemia, right? Rest pain is one thing. Rest pain is because their foot hurts, right, at rest. It's just at rest, they don't have enough circulation to feed the the foot with our oxygenated blood. So what they have to do is they dangle their foot over their bed or they stand and that drives their gravity dependent flow of arterial flow to the foot. That's rest pain. So dependent rubber, can you explain dependent rubber and pallor elevation? What it, why, what is that and why is that important from a clinical standpoint, Austin or John or Jonas or whoever? Um, sure, I can I can explain it. So dependent rubor occurs because your um, vessels are maximally vasodilated um, because they're trying to supply any any blood flow that's there um, to the foot uh, because it's ischemic. Um, and the uh, pallor with elevation occurs, um, I think, because of the the lack of elasticity of the vessels. Um, well, you're draining all that oxygenated arterialized blood, right, from the leg, right? So you squeeze it out, it drains. So the red is oxygenated blood. It's in a maximally vasodilated bed, right? So that's in the dependent rubber. When it's white, it's basically ischemic, right? So even in the, when you look at Raynaud's, the white is ischemia, right? And so anyway, just something to think about is the rubor and pallor elevation. Usually 30 degrees is kind of the, the sign of significant uh, CLI or critical limb ischemia. Um, and then, like you said, they're going to opt. They may not even have rest pain, right? 
they may not have rest pain. They may, why is that? Why would they not have rest pain and still have critical ischemia, but you're not, they don't have pain? Why? Anybody? Their nerves are shut, right? They have neuropathy. Exactly. Their neuropathy is so bad, they can't even feel you. Right. Sometimes the diabetic neuropathy is severe pain. Like it's they can't sleep at night because they're the pain is so bad from the nerve being on fire. But sometimes they don't feel a darn thing, you know? So that's something to be careful. So they may go straight from like nothing to an, a wound. All right. So what are the things we can do to prevent wounds? Hello? Austin, what are the things that we counsel patients when we're... Yeah, exactly. So you have to teach them how to check the foot. How do you do that? So one is to teach the partner or the family how to look at the foot. You take off their shoe, show them the sole of the foot, and you'll see on the heel, because of the on and on dysfunction, it'll be dry and cracked. So sometimes I even advocate some Johnson Johnson baby oil on there just to keep it moist. And also have them check between the feet, the toes. And what you'll also see is they often have hammer toes because of their uh, the, the, the tendons are flexed in diabetes. And so those can be points of impact in between the toes. So I often check, tell them to put a little uh, pads between them, wide base shoes. And the other thing is be careful when they're cutting their nails. So um, sometimes you send them to a specialist to cut it. Or just cut it flat. Don't cut it curved. Always cut it flat so you don't damage your your uh, thing. And they shouldn't cut their own nails. They can't feel. So these are, you have to treat their feet fundamentally different than anyone else. Okay. Um, and any of the, yes, as Austin can tell you, these patients can rapidly progress with a small wound. Uh, Austin, tell me what you think about callus in these patients. Yeah, so uh, callus can be um, dangerous because um, callus can eventually lead to a wound, and sometimes um, callus can be also hiding a wound beneath it. Exactly. So what happens is there's subcutaneous bleeding under the callus. So the callus is because they can't feel, right? So they're putting inordinate pressure on that aspect of the foot, and underneath the callus, there'll be like some hemorrhage, and then eventually an ulcer forms, and eventually bleeding. Um, what are the three types of ulcers, anyone, in the foot? Yeah, arterial, good. Two more. Yep, excellent. And neuropathic, exactly. Arterial, venous, and neuropathic. And you should distinguish those three. How do you distinguish those three? Yeah, location. So arterial... Yeah, location, location, location. Arterial, exactly. Arterial is at the tips of the toe or the heel, the very end of the circulation. How about venous? And they're pain, they can often be painful. Venous, where are they? Yes, the medial malleolus, classic Gaither zone, right? So it's a medial malleolus. They often have hyperpigmentation, may have edema. Um, these are classic kind of uh, cl uh, scenes. They're wet, uh, oozy. They are usually not painful, right? Medial malleolus, that's sort of the GSV is, right? Excellent. And what about neuropathic um, ulcers? How do you define those? Yeah, at pressure points, right? They're classically punched out calluses, kind of a kind of fine granulation base, but it'll be a punched out uh, ulcer. All right, usually not painful. Now you can have mixed wounds. So always think about that. They get mixed arterial venous, mixed neuro ischemic. Okay. So you may have an ischemic neuropathic point and you have to revascularize them. And for general, for neuropathic wounds, how do you cure a neuropathic wound? Offloading, exactly. So when you have a neuropathic wound, the only way for it to fully heal is to offload it. They can have even full no contact boots and things like that that may be needed, but you have to offload it. Yeah, you, you, exactly. Something like that to kind of take off the, the pressure, right? Good. So these are the key things when you come to a wound. How do you tell if it's infected or not? Because if you have a diabetic arterial wound that's infected, how do you know it's infected?
Yeah, definitely if you have pus, what else? Exactly. Rubor, dolor, calor, tumor, right? Is it red? Is it swollen? Is it warm? Is it painful? Those are signs of inflammation, right? Those are signs of infection. And then sometimes we'll do is take a, a probe and see if we can elicit any any purulent material or anything. Okay, so those are key things. And then if that's the case, yeah, fluctuants is no good, right? That suggests something bad is going on, right? So once I identify that, we'll IND it, release the pus, uh, take a little swab and kind of open up that area, bring them to the hospital, admit them, and then and and then revascularize them. So how do I check to see if this person has enough? What are the three criteria to see if a wound is going to heal? Three things. Yep. Perfect. You got it. Wound, infection, and circulation. So even if you have a normal uh, circulation, a small wound with a bad infection, they're not going to heal. doesn't matter if the circulation is good. If it's a big, ugly wound, and it's going all the way to the ankle. It's destroyed. No matter what you do, it's probably not going to heal, even if you have good pulsatile flow. So circulation, though important, that's not the be-all. It's not the only thing you have to be aware of. So three things to make sure that, that you can heal the wound, okay? So these are all categories. And then when it comes to segments of the arteries, also what are the segments that we try to like figure out and how do you tell? Uh, so iliac, <clears throat> uh, femoral popliteal, and then tibial and sometimes pedal. Yeah, exactly. So the inflow, which is the iliac above the inguinal ligament, is the first thing we'll try to fix. You can check that by diminished femoral pulses or an ultrasound if they have non-triphasic waveforms, okay? Or like Austin said, a PVR. And in this situation, a CTA may not be the worst thing, or an ABI can kind of guide you, or like pulse volume recordings, right? So air to iliac, you could usually clear with that. Fempop, um, again, you could do pulse volume recordings or segmental limb pressures or an ABI, an ultrasound. Um, their CT is still pretty good because uh, you know it's, not, it's a bigger vessel. It's about a five to seven millimeter vessel. Um, and so you could still kind of identify flow, et cetera. But when you get to the tibials at the, below the ankle, those are two, three millimeter vessels. You can't see them on CAT scan because they're so full of calcium. MRA may help, but the others won't. Ultrasound may help, but CAT scan won't. So that's kind of quickly how I tell what's going on, okay? So I'm in the office, I get a toe pressure, or I mean, I'll check these kind of different things and I'll be like, okay, you need an angio. And if I want to look at the inflow, I may get already iliac pump pop. Okay. And once I do that, then I'm like, okay, I have a plan. I'm going to go integrate. I'm going to up and over. What am I going to do? Okay. Yeah. Practice your pulse exam. You'll get better the more you do. Right. Once I sort all that out, now I've got a plan of action, right? Then it's just catheters and wires. Like I said, most of the time, what, what we used to do is put a lot of stents in the infraringual or below the, uh, the femoral artery. But now with these new technologies, we try to leave less metal because once the metal's in, and if the scar tissue is very aggressive, it scars like this gummy thick thing. It's hard to get through and keep it open. So if I can just deploy, like if I can un open it up with the, you know, these lithoplasty balloons, kind of like you break up calcium in the kidney stones. You have similar things in the in the um, in the arteries. If I break it up, open it, and elude a drug like paxitaxel, which is a mitot anti mitotic and I prevent proliferation and keep it open without having to put an implant, that's great, right? And then hopefully I prevent a recurrence. And the other thing that we do is adjunctive medication. So tell me some adjunctive medications to keep the patient alive and adjunctive medications to keep the patient uh, uh, vessels open. What, what, what am I gonna do to keep the patient alive? Yeah, high intensity statin. So torvastatin, 80 milligrams, or rosuvastatin, 10, 20, or 40. And the goal LDL is less than 70, if not 55. Yeah, so antithrombotic medications, really, the Compass and Voyager are two randomized control trials. Look in rivaroxamine, which is a, you know, um, basically, you could do a low-dose DOAC, okay, a 10A inhibitor, and it shows a reduction in events, Right. Salazazole is a great agent to improve walking distance by 50% in clodicants, all right? The other thing we'll do, statins, ACE inhibitors, so the HOPE trial, heart outcome prevention event, 
Ramipril was used, but you could use lisinopril, and independent blood pressure reduction should uh, improvement in survival. Okay, so dramatic benefit in the PAD subset. So ACE inhibitors, antiplatelets, you could argue Plavix based on Capri, the cardiovascular uh, uh, for ischemic events. So clopidogrel versus aspirin in the prevention of uh, ischemic events, Capri trial. Okay, so uh, clopidogrel or it's Plavix, um, stat, high intensity statin, an ACE inhibitor, right? And an antithrombotic based on the COMPASS trial and post-intervention, the Voyager trial, the DOAC, okay? And then he's right, blood pressure control. What's your goal blood pressure um, in uh, these patients? Yeah, at least less than 130 over 80, um, potentially even lower based on which big trial that came out, kind of around JNC8. The SPRINT trial, okay? So this is a really important trial that showcased the benefits of low blood pressure. This came right after JNC8, okay? So I think that's an important construct that you need to be thinking about, all right? Statins, ACE inhibitor, antiplatelets, salosal salt, improve walking distance and exercise, okay? Exercise uh, is important. Salosal is also important, okay? And those are, and statins also improve walking distance, all right? And then, um, so I think that covers clodicans critical limb ischemia, wounds, and then you're right, diabetes, we have so many medications to improve them. What is our goal A1C in the diabetic? Now, what are we trying to prevent? Yes, less than 7%. We don't want to get too low. If they're 80 or 90, let them be a little higher, right? Because you don't want to have a hypoglycemic episode in a, in a, mal, in a bad event. What three things exactly? What three things are we trying to prevent in the diabetics? Yes, nephropathy, neuropathy, and retinopathy. So neuropathy, you can do a, a loss of protective sensation. Nephropathy, how do we assess that? Retinopathy, you do a visual scan, right? That eye exam, and and nephropathy, how do you check that? Yes, microalbuminuria, right? So anything less than thirty is usually normal. Thirty to three hundred is abnormal, that anything over 300 is obviously albuminuria, macroalbuminuria. So we're trying to identify microalbuminuria. If it's persistent microalbuminuria, what can we use to reduce diabetic nephropathy or loss of uh, nephrons? You can do that um, because it, in the diabetic population, it can reduce renal impairment. Yeah, ACE-ARB. Yeah, blood pressure control, ACE-ARB. Exactly, right? So if you could do those things, you'll have a dramatic benefit. All right, so I think those are the key things you gotta be thinking about um, when it comes to this population. Good, and I think you control the diabetes, you control their hypertension, you control their statins, and now we can talk about optimizing and, and their orthotics, wide brace shoes, offloading, sometimes scooters, wheelchairs, whatever it takes, right? Frequent wound care, educate the family about how to do the wound care, get wound care nurses, you get wound care certified, and then you prevent events. So again, this is a very huge population of people that you can help. And sadly, in the US and worldwide, it's often the underserved who get undertreated, right? And there's not enough vascular specialists or endovascular specialists in the world to help all these patients, much less US. So you you know you owe it to the public and the patients to first prevent this diabetes, prevent the you know the issues that are occurring because of this. Meaning educate the public, educate undergrad or high schoolers, middle schoolers, and their families about how to prevent this. Um, and then and then prevent the disease. And then once they occur with this disease, educate your co classmates in medical school, educate your co residents in the different things. Hey. This is what we need to do. These are wounds. This is what we can do. This is what we can offer. So you're not just a plumber, but you're a vascular specialist who's managing this patient's condition of disease. And Austin brought up a good point. It is very important for you to counsel a patient to stop smoking. Now, only maybe 5% will stop by you telling them over and over again, but it's better than 0.1% without it. So you go from 1 in 1,000 to 5 in 100, which is a 50-fold impact factor. And nicotine replacement therapy with, a, you know, patches and you know, uh, adjunct of, uh, or, you know, gums will help. Very clean based on the Eagle trial is clearly benefit. And, 
and that kind of the ibuprofen also is a beneficial as is counseling. So these are all things I, you should all implement in. Yeah. And he's exactly right. Cause you know, ultimately what am I doing in the office, right? The most important place for us is where. Yes. It's in the clinic. That is where you have the most impact factor, right? The rest of it's just plumbing, right? So you want to prevent patients from getting to your, your table. Number one thing you as a human in a position as a member of society can do is to prevent this patient from getting to our tables. That's what we need to really advocate for. By the time we get to our table, it's too late. And then how do we educate people about diabetic foot wounds? How do we educate people about orthotics? How do we get everyone on board, identify these things and prevent us having to operate on them, right? And once they get to our table, now we need to use level one evidence as Dr. Uh, uh, soon to be Dr. Amol Patel said, um, is we need evidence to prove what we're doing is right because we, there's a million different devices that are out there, right? But what is the evidence support doing this one versus another thing? And so that's why you have to do clinical trials and VIRs in general and endovascular vessel surgery in these, in this, all these things we do are cool, but where's the randomized control trial where's the prospective data to prove what we do actually works. So I encourage you to always question the data, right? Don't just read an article. If it's retrospective, go, okay, we need a prospective trial. That's all it means, right? A case series, a retrospective analysis it means we need better data. And so I encourage all of you to go start thinking like, okay, let me be the next Suresh Vedantham and do the 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 track trial, the C track trial. Let me be the next Aki assistant and drive the P track trial to look at endpoints that matter to the patient. Right? What does a patient care about? That's what you need to drive. All right. So that's what your goal should be. Like, how do I make this patient have a better outcome? Like, if that was my family member, what questions would I ask the physician? so that my family member can have a better outcome, right? You're not gonna care about, oh, this stent is three times more paid than that other one, right? Um, you're, that doesn't matter. Like, are they gonna lose their leg? Are they gonna be able to walk? Are they gonna have pain? These are the things that you're gonna be thinking about. Are they gonna be able to live a quality life? So that's a question you should be asking when you design a trial. Um, that's pretty much it, Anmol or uh, Chloe, great job. Uh, anything else you wanna add? Thank you. I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, thank you for explaining all that, doing that education. Um, yeah, nothing else to add. Just happy that there's more RCTs coming up. Yeah, thank you so much, Chloe and Anmol, for a great presentation. And um, Dr. Vatican Cherry, as always, we're very appreciative of these great clinical pearls that you've given us. Um, and this great discussion. If any of you again are new to the journal club and want to get more involved and join and possibly present at a future one, please don't hesitate to um, email us. I'm gonna put the email in the chat again and hopefully we'll see you again at our next few journal club. So um, don't wanna keep you guys too long, but thank you so much for being here today and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and I highly recommend joining and applying for our eboard because our eboard applications are now open. So, yep. Thanks, everyone. Hi, thank you for helping us set this up. Thank you so much, guys. Great, great presentation. Thank, thank you. you.